And uh, let's see, today, June 7th, 2011, and kind of an ugly day. Market started out with a rally this morning, but you knew it was suspect. Uh, number one, because it was obvious that the market might try to rally. Notice yesterday, uh, as you were coming down, yesterday you came down four days in a row straight. You undercut this low at 2706.50. So on that undercut, it was logical you might get a little rally like that, but you can see how weak it was. Uh, I think volume was slightly less than yesterday. Uh, to take a look and see how that uh, actually pans out here. Let me check my numbers. <clears throat> Dr. K, are you out there yet? Yeah, sure am. Okay, did we trade heavier volume today? We, we didn't. No, it's no. slightly less on the NASDAQ, but it tells you that we were in a weak rally. Uh, you're 3% lower on the NYC, at least by the numbers at 1.16 p.m., 16 minutes after the close on Tuesday, my time. So uh, it's a weak, weak attempt at a rally. You reverse to the downside, pretty negative. Uh, a lot of stocks looking pretty ugly, but we'll go through some of that. But right now, you're still in the downtrend. And, uh, you know, we had this follow-through day, supposedly, where you're up 1.37% on the NASDAQ. And, uh, Dr. K, the model went to a neutral, and you haven't gone back to a sell signal yet. Uh, what are, can you explain that? Yeah, sure. The, uh, well, the model, first of all, did not go to a buy signal because, of the, first of all, it didn't clear the 1.4%. But even if it had hit a 1.4% threshold level, the model very well probably would have stayed in a cash signal mode simply because of uh, this directionless, trendless market we've been in. Um, and also that day looked, looked fairly suspect uh, regarding uh, leadership action. So it was not to be trusted. And sure enough, the very next day, the market uh, had a pretty bad sell-off. Now, um, one of the rules in my model says to go to a sell signal if that low is broken. And that low was broken the next day. However, because we're in a QE environment, uh, there is an overriding rule that says, uh, because of the QE environment, since that sell signal would have occurred uh, a bit under the prior sell signal, uh, to stay in cash. In other words, just do nothing, take no action. If the market wants to sell off for a little while, go ahead and let it. Uh, but until we see some clearer signs of a, a trend emerging, it's better to stay in cash at this time. Um, and actually, the way things look now, and given what Bernanke I was talking about, basically implying that we're going to have a QE3 in some form, uh, since he needs to keep rates at a very low level, since uh, the uh, unemployment rate is, is moving higher and uh, it doesn't look like the, econ uh, the economy is gaining traction. Uh, therefore, that uh, that's bodes, bodes well for pre precious metals and also potentially for stocks as QE uh, pushes the market higher like it's done since March of 2009. So then um, you're assuming then that QE is still in play and it's going to turn the market around. It, there's no sign of that anything's really changed. Uh, nothing material has changed. In other words, QE is still with us. Uh, Bernanke's more or less said, said right. so in uh, so, so few words. So uh, I would expect that this, uh, this business where the major averages don't sell off more than, you know, 6, 7, 8 percent each time uh, they correct, is probably going to continue. I mean, the only time that the markets have sold off more than more than 10 percent is uh, during May of 2010, and but that's when QE1 ended, and there was no QE2 to take over. So we're hearing from the chairman's mouth that the QE is here to stay in some form because he's going to keep rates uh, as low as possible for the foreseeable future until we start to see uh, an uptick in uh, employment. So, if I can play devil's advocate here, so absolutely, is the assumption then that QE is necessarily going to continue to prop up the economy? So this is where I, I find a little bit of a disconnect for myself, and this is that I, I see the economy is getting weaker, and QE2 came into play last year uh, in, in November, actually, and it's been there ever since, but yet the economy really hasn't gained any traction. So as you... You might look at QE as losing some of its effect over time. The longer it's in place, more participants participants anticipate it, 
and th therefore a lot of it gets priced into the market. For all we know, some of the rally that we've seen recently, for, uh, perhaps from March through May, could be a discounting of the QE3 phenomenon. And now what we're seeing is that QE3 isn't really going to help the economy. It's going to print more money, which I would argue is very positive for precious metals and probably commodities. I'm just wondering whether the, the forces of a rapidly weakening economy, if it begins to spiral out of control, and the Fed gets less traction with QE3, uh, could that be bad for stocks? So I'm actually looking at potential here uh, from, for a, a bifurcated market where, where you see uh, precious metals, commodities uh, rallying on the basis of more money printing and devaluing dollar, because I believe the dollar was down again uh, today pretty good, about half a percent. Yeah, and so I see a devaluing dollar and perhaps a run on dollars in the short term being a negative for stocks. So it's something to watch for. But I'm imagining that if things really, if you get a very strong signal somewhere, the model would switch to a sell. Yeah, absolutely. If, if uh, we start to see an acceleration to the downside, you know, continued breakdown in leadership, uh, the model, that would generate enough selling pressure to push the model into a sell signal. Uh, for now, the model is on a, still on a cash signal. And, and likewise, uh, it's possible, also very possible, that the model could switch to a buy signal uh, on the basis that the QE, um, on the basis of QE effect. Uh, as far as the market preempting or, or looking forward um, and saying that, uh, well, QE2 didn't really help, and so, you know, this QE3 isn't going to really help, that is a factor. That's going to, that's going to be a tug of war about, right. on the and, one hand, you have the market saying, okay, QE's not working, so now the market's going to sell off, versus the dollar continuing its downtrend uh, in where in which case hard assets do well and that would include precious metals commodities and a number of stocks so I think that's going to be a tug of war and we need to see how that plays out in the form of price volume action on the major indices so in other words it comes down I guess at the end to final uh, in final analysis to price volume action so if we start to see an acceleration to the downside then the model would push be pushed into a sell. Likewise, if if we start to see um, a, some sort of st uh, stabilizing here, uh, the model could very well go, be pushed into a buy signal. So here you can see the dollar. This is the UUP, the Power Shares U.S. Dollar Index ETF. So this has come down very sharply, and the dollar had a bounce in the early part of May throughout most of May, and then recently has rolled over. And that's given some strength. Now, the, the interesting thing here is the dollar has rolled over over the past several days, and the market's gone with it. So the market is definitely weakening. When I look at it on a stock-by-stock -stock basis, and I'm looking at the short side, there are some things that actually are, are working pretty well. On March 17th, we did talk about, uh, let me actually, this is the wrong type of chart. We talked about two stocks that we thought fit the model of what you're looking for. And at the time, there were not very many stocks looking uh, like this. This is your classic head and shoulders type formation. You can see Business R. Uh, we talked about it back in here somewhere, <clears throat> I think right about here. And the stocks continue lower. It's breaking down through this uh, support level here at this low. But you still have some room heading down to your uh, neckline, which is somewhere around 16 bucks as I calculate it. Uh, I can use my little handy dandy little tool here so it could be lower than that uh, but you can, I can see this thing breaking down into the high uh, teens so there's a, uh, one situation of a stock that's breaking down and so you don't have to necessarily uh, if you, unless you're trading the index ETFs you don't really have to uh, worry too much about whether the model's on a buy or sell signal in a neutral signal it could be possible and I'm actually finding that to be the case uh, to play some stocks on the short side and they are, some of them are starting to break down, and some of them look like they're starting to accelerate uh, a bit to the downside. Finnis are being one of them down five days in a row, and it was down again today. Uh, another stock that we've been keeping on, and we also posted this as the poster child of a late stage fail base. We have a big climax run here. Here's the base, here's the breakout attempt. Boom, it fails. Takes a little while to come loose, but it's starting to come off. Holding at support at 40, we'll see where this thing goes. But some of these are starting have been steadily breaking down. Whether they break out to the downside, uh, it would probably have to coincide with increased weakness in the, in the Nasdaq index uh, and the rest of the general market indexes. But I think that would probably be the point where you might go to a sell signal, uh, Dr. K. 
Maybe. So some other stuff. Apple. We looked at Apple. Uh, yesterday we put that out as a short sale setup. This is a late stage fail base, predominantly uh, because of this failed breakout right here. So once you have a failed breakout, you can start to look at it that way. You notice it happened a few times before. It's broken the 50-day moving average. It breaks down a fair bit and then rallies back up. You had one, two, three breaks to the downside, and then now you've also had one, two, three rallies to the upside. Uh, so I felt like at this point you're kind of getting long in the tooth here, and as I pointed out uh, in yesterday's short sale setup email, this you have one, two, and now this is the third long duration consolidation you've had in Apple. And so beginning to think that this becomes a little bit too obvious at this point, and it's possible the stock may head a lot lower from here. But the point is, if you're going to try and short something like this, and you want to look at it as a late stage fail base, there's a lot of selling in the base. You have these big waves, and that just shows the tug of war between uh, the buyers coming in late, I think, and steady distribution. And I think Apple's a pretty obvious story at this point. So yesterday you pick up bond, you break below the 50 days, so that's your short sale point. You don't know if it's going to work or not, and there's no way that you're ever going to know for sure whether it's going to work or not. But so far it is working out because volume picked up today, and Apple was down all day despite the fact that the market was up. And uh, right at the opening it could have been shorted again and broke down another percent or so. So we're looking for this thing to head for the 200-day moving average right now at about 322.52. Um, other than that, there aren't a huge number of setups. There are some other interesting things. Uh, this is what I call a pinhead and shoulders type of setup here. Uh, travels are breaking down from here. Uh, watch for rallies back up into this area. So my, my, my guess is if this is a real top, this thing's going to do a little of this and eventually break down uh, and come down a lot further. Right now it's in a position where it should rally after undercutting. But now you've kind of got a left shoulder here. You know, little, here's the top of your right shoulder. Your neckline is running right through here. So right at the neckline, you're probably going to bounce, and then watch how it rolls, uh, if it rolls over on that bounce. I keep an eye on that one. Um, Google's another one I'm watching on the short side. Uh, you can see that Google is in this giant, if you look at this actually in more compressed fashion, you can actually see here's a weekly chart. So here's this giant cup with handle, and... Uh, you have one big cup with handle, and the handle on this is another big cup with handle, and the handle on this is another big cup, cup and handle. It's like those uh, little Russian dolls where you have one inside the other, and that's what you're getting here. Now, this last cup with handle is a late stage fail base. Google's starting to break down. I actually think that Google is probably under longer term distribution. I know everybody talks about the Android phone, but everybody knows about that, and it, it's such a hot thing. Why hasn't the market been? Uh, taking Google stock up, why has it continued to uh, break to the downside? And you have this huge gap here on the daily chart, which I think is very negative. Uh, resistance here, which is basically the bottom of the gap down or the falling window, as you might call it. Uh, if you're a candlestick charting aficionado, that's, uh, that's the term used for a gap down move. It becomes a, a window. At the bottom of it, you have resistance. Stock still can't get through it working its way lower. It looks to me like it's going to try and break out to the downside, but I think this would coincide with the market indexes coming off, but that's not necessarily the case because if the market's just mushy and slushy throughout the summertime, then you know you could still see some big leading stocks break down and perhaps be shorted. Well, I think Apple is the other one, and of course Apple is an example of a big cap tech leader, a big stock leader in the market, breaking down on a day uh, during the morning when the market was actually up. So uh, to me, these are kind of weak situations, but there aren't a lot of short sale setups. They're starting to, to uh, uh, occur. You're seeing some of them. I think FCX, uh, Freeport Macaran might be one. You know, had resistance uh, up here at the 50-day moving average. It's come down. Now it's below the 200-day. Of course, this could be shortable using the 200-day as your stop. It, it looks like it's a dome of death sort of situation, and for those of you who are into the... Uh, head and shoulders, you, if you see head and shoulders everywhere, you might see one here. The only thing about this is that the right shoulder is above the left shoulder, if this is a head and shoulders. I tend to look at it as just kind of a rolling kind of top, and you're just about to cross the 10 week, which is a 50 day, the blue line here, just about to cross below the 40 week or the 200 day moving average. 
So, so on balance, I'm seeing more stocks that look like they're short sales than I'm looking at stocks uh, or seeing stocks that look like they're buys. Dr. K, you there? Yeah. Uh, have, how, have you seen a lot of stocks that you consider to be in, in buy positions or in strong buy positions? Well, that's really the strongest argument for uh, pushing the model into a sell signal because uh, there are very, very few buys. I mean, I, actually, I, I can't think of any buys at this time unless we're talking about silver <laughs> or gold. So yeah, if we're talking either. about basic stocks, you know, gen general stocks. I'm not seeing anything on my screens. I run, I run the screen throughout the day, and nothing's coming through. So, um, you know, the the that's the most powerful argument for a sell signal, and the most powerful argument for a buy signal is continued QE. So let's. I want to see which uh, which one wins the tug of war. Which one wins the tug of war? Yeah, definitely. But you know, it's definitely a confusing and challenging market. I know somebody made a comment uh, after IB, I, Investors Business Daily had gone to a market in uptrend uh, one day and then the very next day switched to uh, market in correction and somebody commented somewhere that uh, really it should, they should have a third one for a market like this which is market in confusion. Yeah, and I saw that. The case. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was pretty funny but uh, it, it, it does feel like that. So really you know, you're going to play the market. The thing, ahead, of the, the thing of it is, is that uh, you know, on that day, because uh, I, I track a bunch of models uh, that I have high regard for, and virtually every single, well, I'm not going to say every single one, because there's actually there is one that comes to mind that has held its own this this year, but but virtually every single every other model has not hold held its own, and, and it's underwater uh, because it's a trendless environment, and those models went to a buy signal on that day and uh, naturally uh, failed. So it's it is one of the most challenging markets uh, I've seen because who likes trendless, choppy, uh, sloppy patterns? You can't really make much uh, out of them. So uh, I I am glad though that the that because of the QE effect, uh, the model has adopted rules as of well those rules have been in effect since late 2009, and that's helped keep the model. Uh, a bit longer in certain buys and a bit shorter in certain sells. Uh, when I say shorter, I mean shorter duration in terms of sell signals uh, because of this QE effect. And it will remain uh, on those on those rules until uh, there's ample evidence that QE has definitely come to an end. Yeah, I would note, note that even this pattern, while it looks you know, like it's shortable. If you really look at what's going on, it's just really jagged, really zigzagging around, uh, and no real clear break yet in in the stock. So, and that's really been the case with uh, Apple. Yeah, now, with the signal weekly, weekly on FCX is very uh, uh, telling um, about that comment you just made. That's pretty. It, it, it's sloppy. There's real yeah. no. There's no real trend going on in there. Yeah, it's just kind of back and forth. It looks like it could break on the basis of what you're seeing in moving averages, uh, but it could just as well, you know, tread around here for a while and not really go anywhere. So, uh, to some extent, not playing the market right now is probably going to make you more money than uh, trying to play the market. I think, uh, unless we're going with the trend in the metals. What I want to go over real quickly, though, is when we when we look at the metals, the driving theme here is that. The government, the U.S. government, is not going to solve the budget uh, crisis. I saw a news item yesterday that Representative Ryan's plan, which a lot of people say is radical, uh, that they uh, that that plan projects at the end of a decade still over twenty trillion dollars in uh, total U.S. debt, and so really that's not cutting it back. And when you figure that we have another fifty trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities or pensions for uh, government workers and Social Security, Medicare, whatever. Uh, it tells you just kind of how hopeless the situation is in terms of some real cuts uh, being enacted. And as we look at it, it seems like you're getting more and more to the point of default or devalue. And defaulting may be something that includes restructuring debt. So in other words, you saw the other day that Greece is talking about restructuring some of their bonds to lengthen the maturity date. Uh, basically just kicking the can down the road so they don't have to pay it until later on and the US heading that route as well so uh, and I think that's a possibility uh, and if that does happen the markets could get dislocated very quickly but in the meantime I would say keep an eye on the dollar 
and keep an eye on precious metals. Uh, I don't know if commodities, because they may have, they don't really have like copper and oil and things like that. They don't have the same characteristic that gold and silver do as alternative currencies, and that's really what we're looking at when we're talking about the precious metals. And so as an alternative currency, the counterweight is the dollar. And the dollar coming off, you know, when the dollar rallied back in early May, that's when the metals topped and the dollar coming off again has been associated with a shell recovery off the lows in silver and a, a move to almost uh, highs uh, in gold, okay? So really you're going to be keying off the dollar. And if the dollar runs to these lows, which I think it, it will eventually, then the precious metals could be hurling themselves higher in rapid order. Now, there's one thing about the metals that I think you have to watch out for, and that is if the stock market begins to sell off in response to a run on the dollar, then uh, you could see silver and gold in the short term get dragged down because there's a lot of exposure to the metals out there among institutional investors. A lot of hedge funds have played into commodities and bought the precious metals. And if their stock positions start going down, then what's going to happen is they're going to start to get margin calls and they will start selling whatever serves as a source of funds. And if they've got some silver and gold, they could put some pressure on them in the short term. Uh, long term, we still think these things are going higher. Hey, Dr. Hey, what's your price target on silver again? 100. 100. Yeah, and he's not drinking, okay. And I got to tell you, I probably, uh, I would say that's probably where we're headed because, as I said, we don't see these uh, politicians coming up with a solution. So one of two things is going to happen, default or devalue, and the markets are going to force the issue. Okay, so keep your eye on the dollar. See, this but, is what I like about charts. If you, if you pull up a weekly chart of SLV. Oh, this is good, actually. <laughs> and you'll see that $100 is not very far away from where it's at. If you, if you look at a longer-term chart on silver, you can see that it looks like it's just getting going. The move is just starting, starting higher. Uh, in other words, 100 is potentially just the first, you know, first stop. That's not my final target for silver by any means. I'm saying that the next stop on silver could very well be about $100. <clears throat> okay, looks a long ways to me, but I guess it depends on how you scale your. Your chart, no, but you're right. You're you're scale, up here. On a, you've got it scaled on a log. Okay, you got it scaled logarithmically. That's good. Yeah. So well, if you, if I think you notice that a double, a double from 25 to 50, that is the same spacing on a log chart as a doubling from 50. Yeah. To so it'd be a, yeah. So it's not that. You're right. It's not that far away. Right. It's another double. The other thing I notice on the weekly chart. <clears throat> is that these three weeks when you came down, you closed off the lows, and, and this week you did pretty well, you closed off the low here, and then here you closed well up in the upper part of the range, but notice the tight closes. So what it seems to me is when you came down hard, you get some support in here, now you're trying to come up off the lows. And right now, <clears throat> I'm looking for some strength in silver to flash some sort of a pocket pivot, and so what you're gonna wanna look for is if you've got some kind of move up off the 10-day moving average, and I'm sure it would coincide with the move in gold. So gold is really the leader here. Dr. K, would you consider, let's say we saw a pocket pivot volume move up off the 10-day, which is the magenta line here, but it's still below the 50-day. Would you consider that uh, potentially a positive sign for silver? Yeah, I would, I would be adding to my position on, on that kind of uh, move in silver. It doesn't have to be above the 50-day. Right, and probably because you're just correlating to what's going on with gold, which looks to be in a position to, to flash a pocket pivot move on the GLD. So for gold, you're looking at volume of uh, 13,552,553 is what the total number is on this day. So volume greater than that and a move up off the 10-day would be a pocket pivot on the GLD. So make a note of that. And the SLV, which you're looking for here, is a pocket pivot, pivot off, off of this level. Now, this may not happen right away. You just want to watch for it and be patient, I think. Um, and I and on this one, you'd want to see volume greater than 59,322,605. So I actually have volume alerts set on those ETFs, which I'm keying on uh, with some of the, the AGQ or the DGP if I want to play some of those uh, more leveraged uh, ETFs if these things start to move, which there is potential for. And I think if there's a run on the dollar, that's definitely what you're going to see. Yeah, keep keep in mind that... that um, uh, May and June for gold, there t tends to be uh, weak in demand during those months. 
And so, uh, in fact, if you go back uh, many, many years and you look at the price of gold, it tends to, at best, move sideways uh, during those months. And so that gold has actually moved higher in, month, in the month of May, I think, is a su signal that, that the dollar is going to get weaker and that QE is going to continue. And, uh, but that, that said, I would not at all be surprised to see gold hesitate and move sideways, say, for the next few weeks before it gains traction. And then actually, if it does that, that would be a very nice cup and handle formation on gold and a great uh, green light for, uh, for uh, jumping in or adding to existing positions. Yeah, you'll notice here it tried to break out on what was a pocket pivot volume signature, but it was extended from the 10-day moving average. Here, actually, a lot closer. So if you would get it, if this line comes up a little more, you'd probably be right along it, and it may occur a few weeks out. But this is definitely what we're watching for. Okay, We're not really interested in buying any stocks right now. They all look pretty ugly for the most part, so we're keying on silver and gold, and we think that's where the opportunity is. There could also be a situation, as I see it, uh, since I like to short stocks, where you can actually be going after stocks if the general market is weak, but I think you could still see uh, silver and gold continue higher if the dollar is, is uh, breaking down sharply, which I think could be negative for stocks, positive for precious metals. And then I think with oil, you know, if you're looking at the USO, for example, to me this looks like it wants to head lower. You got this big break. You really haven't had a rally. Uh, notice the resistance here up at the 65-day exponential, which is my secret moving average, as you all know. Uh, and it's it's holding in between, so it's just kind of sitting in here somewhere. It's going to break out or break break out to the downside or the upside and get out of out of this consolidation. But this may be telling you that it's less. This is more related to the economy, and so uh, it's telling you that we're going to have soft demand for oil. So that's why at my earlier I said that I think uh, a breakdown in the dollar may be may have a muted effect on commodities that are dependent on economic demand. Now uh, there has been talk of China slowing down, but today uh, that's okay. There's some noise or news rather that China is going to ease up on on uh, raising interest rates because their economy is slowing down. Right, that's right. So uh, I think it was HSBC came out with the report being bullish on China. China is, uh, it, it, it's been consolidating for quite some time. And, uh, you know, because the, the bank there keeps uh, hiking rates and raising uh, bank reserve requirements. So as you can see on a, on a weekly, on say uh, the FXI ETF, it's pretty much flatlined since December of 2009 really gone nowhere uh, but it's it looks to me like it's setting up a platform from which it can it could break out uh, especially if the central bank really starts to uh, relax uh, the uh, the interest rate environment which one was that which was that FXI Frank X-ray Indian oh man let's see China I don't know it looks like it wants to go down if you look at it look at a weekly weekly is a lot better uh, for perspective on this one and, yeah, it's uh, so, yeah, sideways. It could go either way. It looks like to me. Yeah, actually, if you bring in, uh, if you go back to 2008, include and include uh -huh. the weekly, then you can see how compressed the market's been since uh, 2008. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's been pretty much sideways. Interesting. So you know that the China thing works two ways. If, if China gets real weak, that could have a negative effect on commodities. But I, I think less on silver and gold because of the alternative currency. Uh, feature on those. Let's see. Uh, some people asking us about TLT with bonds in versus the TBT. Uh, bond market, let's go over here. You know, bonds had rallied off the lows. It looks to me like a, a nice, you know, move off the lows here. Uh, down here is when PIMCO announced that they were dumping or that they had finished dumping all of their. Uh, treasuries and other bonds and so now some of that pressure came off the market you've been rallying it's still been an uneven rally you got below the 200 day moving average on the TLT and you're back above it today and it's still choppy I think the bonds strangely enough are it could be a function of a, a fear bid and money from uh, the eurozone or, or other places uh, where they're perceiving problems they may be coming into bonds Dr. K what's your take on this it's a bit of a paradox with the dollar going lower, yeah. I think, well, I think you know it's 
that 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 bonds are the price of bonds are going up, so the yields going down. Just anticipation of uh, Bernanke holding true to his word that he's going to keep rates as low as possible. So in other words, you know, I Bill Gross of Pimco, and you know, he's he's a absolute wizard when it comes to bonds. But it's possible that uh, everyone is just uh, miscalculating the timing of when uh, bond interest rates are really going to start heading higher. Right. And of course, he's got a lot of bonds. He's got, you know, he can't just get over, get out of his positions overnight. So I think he's just preempting what he believes is going to happen down the road, which I do agree. I do agree with that position that ultimately the bond bull market is over and, and bonds are in for a nasty bear market, prolonged bear market. But that said, don't fight the Fed. And uh, I think the, that the Fed can keep the interest rate level very low for an extended period here. So right. TLT could continue this kind of sideways upwards rally for, for a bit longer. Yeah, here's a weekly chart. You can see the break off the peak here in early 2009 or late 2008. And you notice there was a fear bid coming into bonds back then. And of course, then that broke down. And you've been finding support down around these lows in here, I guess in the 85 level. Uh, and this is just a retracement of less than uh, this. Um, a good question is, where is the buy signal in SLV? Uh, there's a couple of things here to think about. We've talked about the fact that gold and silver tend to correlate. So you can almost use gold as a guide for silver. Okay. And when I was on Fox last Tuesday, I pointed out that we got a buy signal, a, a bona fide objective buy signal in the GLD in gold on May 20th. That's right here. And as you all know, that was a pocket pivot buy point. So that's a buy point in silver, uh, silver as well, potentially, just on the basis of uh, gold. Now you notice, whereas gold has the pocket pivot type move, which is a bona fide pocket pivot, it continues higher. But silver not having it, here is the same day as a pocket pivot in gold, right here on this gap up day, right there. Okay, and it pulls back and actually undercuts that gap up day. So it's a little bit weaker. But there's a very rudimentary uh, buy signal that you can use just to get a sense of where the trend might be in the short term and whether silver is stabilizing along with gold. But gold is acting very well, so that argues in favor of silver continuing to act well from here. Unless gold rolls over, I don't think you'll see silver roll over. But you know, it's possible that gold could pull back uh, sharply, and that might coincide with the retests of the lows down here or down to the 200-day uh, moving average down here, 29.58. I would kind of see that. This has probably come up here by then. And I would see that as your, your major buy point on the pullback. And yet, no, we don't look at stocks the same way as we, we don't, or we don't look at silver and gold the same way, or commodities the same way as we look at stocks. That's one of the reasons why we're not so worried about a pocket pivot occurring in here off the 10 day. We're not so worried about the 10 day being below the 50 day moving average, which we probably would be if this were a stock. But remember, it's a commodity. But a very simple buy signal is 10 day, the magenta line crossing over the 20 day. Or you can use a 21 day. I don't really think it matters here. But that's a very simple buy signal. If you wanted to start nibbling in here on that basis, now you could try and build a small position and just see what happens. If it starts to break down and you break support in here at, say, 35 ish, uh, then maybe uh, you've got a problem and you're going to head lower. So you could just stop yourself out and rethink it. But I think the most powerful uh, buy signal would be a, a confirming pocket pivot move somewhere off the 10 day. Uh, in here over the next coming days or weeks. And that might coincide with the same thing occurring in gold. Okay, And so that's where the buy signals come in. You can also see that gold had a, one of those very simple buy signals a few days ago, and it has continued higher, and the spread between the 10-day and the 20-day has actually widened as, as GLD has gone higher. So that's really where that comes from. Um, so it's not really some secret buy signal. If there was a pocket pivot, I guarantee you guys would have known, and you knew all about the pocket pivot in the GLD when that happened. Um, you know, some of these stocks, I, I'm not really interested in buying anything, so everybody asking questions about what do you think of this stock, what do you think of that stock. Right now, our view on all stocks is we don't want to own them. So there, so if you're long something that's down 20% off its high, we don't want to own it. We don't want to own you know, AGU. Are we going to buy this? I don't think so. Are you going to short it? Well, you could try, but again, choppy pattern, a lot like FCX. Um, you know, we can look at some of these other uh, ag stocks like Monsanto, for example. Um, 
Let's look at that. Wind broke down pretty good today. That looks pretty nice. Um, I'm not sure how that came up. I must have clicked something. But that's a daily chart on uh, Monsanto. It's it's just a big jaggy pattern right now, but it's starting to get ugly. So the ags in general, potash, you know, looking the same way. I think CF was the only one that was acting halfway decently, trying to break out. Um, SQM, everybody knows about that one. That's actually has broken out. That's one of the stronger ones. Um, not really quite sure why, but I, I'm not really interested in any of those stocks right now. And I don't think Dr. K is either. So some of these stocks like Baidu, you know, I don't know, there's a logical uh, point for it to rally here. Uh, let's say that for some reason QE prevailed here. And we saw the market turn and you have a pocket pivot. Something to watch for here. Baidu is a big stock. You know, it's been it's been getting hit pretty good. You broke down once. You come all the way down on top of this pattern, this little formation here, and you find support. You bounce, and today you undercut. Now it's possible you get a shakeout plus. I probably use like eight shakeout plus eight, so one thirty two. If you got in here and you saw some huge volume coming in, that could be a shakeout plus. N, where N is about equal to about 8 to 10 percent, more or less. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not an exact science in terms of you doing these shakeout plus 3 or shakeout plus 6 or shakeout plus 10. You know, Livermore used to use shakeout plus 3 for 30 to 50 dollar stocks, you know, so you could double that, you know, 6, 7, 8, 10, something like that. But you, you would get a sense, but you know, you just have like a 5 percent stop on it, it's not going to kill you. If you try to to buy it, but that's something to look at. I mean, that's a little tricky. Uh, you're probably better off though trying to buy pocket pivots and anything that's turning. But right now, I don't even see anything really in position to have a pocket pivot. Uh, just just go through my list real quick, and I'm just gonna fly through these things. Okay, let's just look at the the. This is kind of like the dog pound. Okay, we got uh, Apple uh, getting hammered, ACI Arch Coal getting hammered. This ACTG is kind of coming apart, but it's a thin stock, and it's kind of a dog. Adtran, you know, below its 50-day, it's looking like a dog. Uh, AGQ is silver, looking okay. That's on my buy list. AH, Accretive Health, you know, looking like a dog. These are stocks that at one point were acting pretty well, and now they're just kind of coming apart. Alaska Air broke out, coming all the way back, looking a little bit doggy. Altera looked like it was going to come out, just chop and slop, building a flag. Uh, really going nowhere. It's hanging in there. I don't know. Do you put that on your watch list? I don't know. Amazon now below its 50-day moving average, running into some problems and starting to fail. I, I really consider the 190 level as being a key support level. So you can see it broke down below that, rally back up to it. And, you know, I don't want to own this. So, like I said, I don't want to own any stocks right now. Acme Packet, eh, really a go nowhere stock. But look at chop and stop, chop and stop. You go short here, what if it runs back up another five points? Who knows? Flip, uh, flip a coin, roll the dice, whatever you want. It looks, it's still choppy and sloppy. Uh, this looks a little bit weak here, but it trades overseas, and so you get a lot of like, gaps in the pattern. Uh, today, heavy volume could get above the 50-day. That's looking kind of doggy. Uh, Aruba, to me, this looks like a short. You've got a left shoulder here. Here's your head. You got a big volume break. The thing is kind of wedging up here. It, it, this may break down. I keep an eye on this one. That's on my short sale list. I actually shorted a little bit uh, up here the other day and got a little bit off of it. But you know, really going nowhere because there was no pickup in volume on the downside. So by the end of the day, I just covered that. I, I would be looking for it to head for the 200 day. But again, it's kind of a the way the market is. It's hit and run, and if you're lucky, you, you hit and run at all the right places. Because if you don't, you're going to be getting nicked to death. And that seems to be the case in a lot of these. Um, We've seen a few things work out on the short side, but it's far and few between, and nothing where you're building enough of a trend to really be comfortable uh, going in heavy. Athena Health, that was one acting well. Now a dog. Avago, uh, kind of hanging in there, but you know, it tries to break out and it's sloppy. You got some heavy, uh, heavy gap, heavy volume gap down here, uh, heavy volume gap down in here. You know, this stock, I don't, I don't understand why anybody would bother with this. Look at the, all these heavy volume gap downs in here. Uh, yes, that's, you know, send that back to the dog pound. AutoZone had this nice gap up move, but that's failing, okay? So, uh, General Cable was one that was looking good, and it's breaking down. Uh, Baker Hughes, still acting okay, hanging in there, but how much, for how much longer? You know, nothing really consistent. Chop and slop, chop and slop. Um, 
Baidu we looked at already. Biogen, we, you know, building a flag, maybe it tries to come out. You're looking for a pocket pivot or something in there, but it's holding in okay. It's just coming down to its 10-week moving average. Uh, who knows? Maybe it would come off of there uh, if the market turned. But again, you know, n nothing there really to be playing right now. Uh, Caterpillar has been a big leader, and right now all it's doing is starting to kind of come off. And it's ugly, but it's choppy. And who knows? Maybe it gets support down around these lows and bounces back up. You know, it's just kind of that way. Cavium Networks again, just a real choppy, ugly pattern. And as I go through these, you're going to see uh, this market stinks. On the long side, there's really nothing. Cordelline, all the miners looking bad. Uh, and here's another uh, metals play, resource stock, Cliffs Natural Resources. Okay, it looks like it wants to break. How do you know it doesn't bounce? Maybe you go after them if you want to, but you know, keep tight stops if you really think these look ugly and they're headed lower. Uh, Continental Resources is a choppy and sloppy uh, stock on the upside and guess what? It's just as choppy and sloppy on the downside. So kind of doggy. CMG, Chipotle, Mexican Grill still holding up relatively. Uh, holding its 20 day moving average now but nothing exciting here. No volume on this move to new highs so you've got to be a little bit suspicious of that. Uh, Cummins engine, you know, here's a stock broke out, nice gap out, trend line breakout. We put that as a Bible gap and it failed pretty quickly, continuing lower. Uh, this Cephade is kind of interesting, holding in pretty tight. You know, the top three or four medic, uh, groups, I think actually four out of the top six groups have been medical groups recently. Um, you know, this isn't a nice weekly pattern. It's had a nice move, but one to keep on your watch list perhaps. Uh, Salesforce, you know, tried to break out. Here's your Bible gap. It's moved below that. I don't know if it's going to come come in a little more and then try and go out, but still, you know, it's just sloppy, sloppy action. Uh, let's move through a few more of these. Citrix, this was looking good. You had a pocket pivot here coming out of a nice uh, four weeks tight or three weeks tight formation here. Yeah, it comes in, okay? So more of the same. You want to get a headache, buy these stocks. Uh, let's see, Cypress Semiconductor is acting okay. It's kind of drifting in. Maybe it needs to go sideways for a while. Might be okay. Uh, deer, doggy. I don't know, I don't know if I'd short it, but here, because you're undercutting these levels in here and you're down into here. I don't know. It looks a little too obvious. No heavy selling today. It did reverse, though, so maybe it does break down. But not sure if I'd be shorting this in this position. Uh, you can, you know, you could use a high of today as your stop if you wanted to go after something like this, but uh, I'm not guaranteeing that you'll have any success. Deckers, uh, breaking down, another one. Uh, and, you know, I could just go through stock after stock today. GMCR had a nice pocket pivot, and now it's coming back in, so going nowhere with that. Uh, some of the other hot stocks, you know, I, I know people are asking us about stocks. You know, that's, that's another biotech holding up. It's been one of the very, the better... Uh, groups in terms of uh, holding up a lot of the medical stocks. But this one, what do you think of this one, Dr. K? Negative earnings growth, or, or losing money, so it's a speculative biotech. You know, if you want to play this kind of thing, I, I wouldn't mess with it, not in this market. Great price momentum, but uh, again, uh, the, even in any kind of market environment, this is going to be a lot more speculative simply because it's not earning earning anything yet. Yeah. So, you know, stuff like JDSQ, the, the, they're just not happening. You know, one after the other, they're not happening. So if you're sitting in there thinking that they're magically going to turn around when they're just getting sloppier and sloppier, you're better off just being out. Uh, Joy Global looks like cat, kind of doggy. Uh, Lululemon coming down and just continues to weaken. Uh, LYB lined out, Basil continuing to weaken. Molly Corp, you know, it's holding up in here now, retesting the lows again. I would look for it to build a base, but. If the market gets a lot weaker, it's probably going to hit a lot lower as well. So you know, a lot of these stocks will pull off further with the market, and that's going to be the factor, which is why we don't want to own any stocks right now. Uh, anything else that looks interesting or that we should talk about? Netflix, late-stage breakout from here. We'll see what happens. But I uh, got hammered yesterday off the peak. Didn't recover much today. Sitting at the 10-day moving average. Uh, if you own it, I think your stop is probably the top of the space. But there's, again, not too much exciting there. You know, some of the railroads have been trying to act okay. Uh, Norfolk Southern, Union Pacific, these are all holding prior breakouts, but is there any excitement there? No, nope, not right now. Uh, let's see, looking through this, uh, what else do I have? 
you know, as, as bad as things are looking right now, just everyone should always keep in mind that the markets can turn on a dime. And I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't be surprised if, say, uh, at the end of next week, we're seeing stocks that are viable again. Uh, so yeah, always that's a possibility. Screen, watch lists, uh, run your screens. Uh, we certainly run ours. And when we do see potential candidates, we add them to our watch lists. Um, my watch list isn't very long right now, but it does contain a few dozen names. Uh, I just probably, my, my guess is that uh, where things are right now, um, you know, just to keep at it, but, uh, you know, we may or may not see viable names over the next uh, several days. So it's good to be patient in these environments. <clears throat> Somebody was pointing out that we talked about this last time that Molly Corp had uh, issued a uh, notice that they're filed. They actually filed for 11.5 million shares uh, from selling shareholders. So the insider's stock came off a lockup, and the insiders have elected to, to take the orderly way, which is to, to do a secondary offering and offer their stock that way and trade it out on the block like that. And I think that's a smart way to do it. It's much more orderly than pinging the market. It gets it out of the way and establishes a price ceiling or price floor for the stock. So, uh, but again, this has just got to take some time to uh, set up. So, <clears throat> and then we're getting some questions. Do we use RSI? I, sometimes I look at RSI. It's not the be-all, end-all of indicators. And I don't think you need to get caught up in too many indicators. Sometimes I look at a two-day RSI uh, just if I'm shorting, you know, and I look at a few things. Uh, sometimes it doesn't tell you much anything, you know, but uh, and sometimes I'll just reference it because if I've got a RSI down here on a two-day and I'm trying to short something that's got the RSI on this side, then I've noticed your odds of success are not that great. You have better odds of success if your RSI is up here, but it's not always the case, and so it's not something that is a magic formula or there's some magic RSI that's going to make all your trades right. You have to learn to use indicators uh, yourself and you have to learn how they react in terms of market context, in terms of the various stocks you're playing or commodities or whatever. And you become familiar with them. It's a lot like uh, moving averages. So you know, the more you want to complicate your life with then the more complicated your life can be as a trader. But I think in general yeah, if you have a couple things you look at every once in a while um, and you find them useful and over time you've learned how to use them or become familiar with how uh, a certain looks of RSI or whatever peaks and valleys or whatever correlate with a certain stock and how that can be helpful at certain times. It's, it's, it's still really something quantifiable within the overall art of investing and trading. There's a certain aspect of uh, bringing art to bear in terms of being able to uh, understand things like market context and, and concepts that are not so quantifiable. Do you agree, Dr. K? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, well, basically what you just said uh, is I, I think uh, O'Neill, back in the day, you know, he used to always talk about how he kept things super simple, just price, volume, action, and then a couple moving averages. In fact, he doesn't, he never liked using the 10-day or the 20-day or the 21-day. He used the 50-day and the 200. But to me, that was a little bit, that wasn't my style. I wanted to have a little bit more detail. But I will say that when I first got to the firm, I had lots of bells and whistles. And over the years and working with him, I got rid of every single one. Every single one served as kind of like training wheels, um, kind of a safe, uh, psychological safety net. But I found that, that as I diminished the number of indicators I was using, uh, and my focus in terms of what was really important was... Uh, much stronger and so in busy market environments where there's lots of stocks that are viable uh, it was really nice to be able to just be focused um, on the best stocks using just a few simple indicators as to uh, when to buy yeah and really it's you know over time so um, any questions here no not, not too many questions well there, there's that one uh, it's related to Q, since since there is a concern that QE2 is ending at the end of June, um, I suppose the thinking is, well, will there be a break like there was after QE1? And, uh, you know, we'll have to see in terms of price volume action on the markets if, if there is a break or isn't. Uh, it doesn't sound like there's going to be a break because Bernanke will continue to keep rates very, very low and they can continue to um, uh, monetize debt in other ways. 
but for the for the sake of answering this question, uh, the the weak sectors after uh, QE one ended were uh, well, the techs got hit very hard, and so did commodities. Uh, so you know, I would keep an eye on both of those groups. Tech has been pretty weak um, in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, commodities was weak after uh, well, the silver bubble popped, the intermediate term bubble, I should say. Um, and uh, but all indications show to me that commodities are stabilizing and probably going to going to run higher. Tech remains to be seen. So basically, to sum up here, the only things we're looking at right now as potentially viable are silver and GLD. Um, you know, we're we have positions in them, but we're you but you start building your positions starting out. So we're not here to tell people whether we're 200% in or 100% in. And in fact, if we told you why, why would that be meaningful? What if I told you that I'm in 200% long uh, silver and I bought it at 32.65 and Dr. K is 20% uh, long silver and he bought it at 34. So what does that tell you? What are you going to do now? Are you going to put your whole account 200% long silver now because I'm 200% long silver and I bought it at 32.60? Um, it, it's, it's, you see, the one thing I think you're really going to miss is if you're going to be busy seeing whether you can follow us or do what we're doing uh, or somehow whether we're, one of us is in heavy or the other one isn't or we're both in heavy or we're both in light, that somehow that's, and that has something to do with you or how you would be handling the position. And I don't think you really want to go there. Actually, the, be, the best way to... Go ahead, Dr. I was, okay. was going to say that I think the best way to say it is if I were to trade like you in terms of position sizing, it would mess up my, my style. And if you were right. to trade like me, the same thing would happen to you. So in other words, we're not asking each other, okay, how much did you buy and where did you buy it? Right. It's relevant to our trading style. Right. And to tell you the truth, Dr. K and I, for the most part, don't know what each other are up to. So why the hell do you want to know what the two of us are up to since neither one of us cares what the other one is up to? <laughs> and it, so there's the paradox, everybody. You know, you, you want to know what we own. Uh, how much, where we came in, where we bought and sold. Sometimes, you know, like Dr. K one day was buying Molly Corp three times in one day. And, uh, you know, if he started telling you every time he's buying that during the day, it'd probably just uh, confuse you more than anything. So, Dr. K, do you have any comments on the TZA? Well, I like uh, TNA, TZA uh, as, as a, you know, as, as the three times ETF trade. Uh, in relation to the uh, market direction model. So, uh, you know, obviously on a sell signal, I love the TZA, and on a buy signal, I love TNA. Okay, that pretty much uh, sums it up. Is there is there some beautiful chart pattern here that we should be buying into? Uh, <laughs> Isn't there a pocket pivot no. here in the TZA? No. It, I would not use pocket pivots, uh, actually, because the question has come up. I would never use pocket pivots on, um, actually, I would not use structure on two times or three times ETFs. No. I would use one times ETF in the base, you know, the basic one, like QQQ, right. SPY, uh, ETFs of that nature. So, so whenever you're interpreting a TZA or a TNA or any of those leverage, an SQQQ, you want to refer to the underlying index or the 1x uh, underlying ETF, correct? That's right. So if you're looking at the TZA and the TNA, then you're interpreting either one of the, the upside or the downside on the basis of what's going on here. So if you're trying to interpret the TZA, well, if we turn this upside down, yeah, the TZA looks like it broke out of uh, some low, but all that does is correspond to what's going on in the Russell index, which is the IWM and you're basically breaking a level of support. See, the one thing I notice on all the indexes here, and whoops, let's cancel that. Is it, well, first of all, this is undercutting these lows, so it's in a position where it could rally, and you're down four or five days. Even though today was ugly, uh, you could still get faked out uh, tomorrow, and I think that, in general, anything could happen right now. Uh, so if we go back to the NASDAQ composite, this is where you are, and you've come down a fair ways. You've undercut this low. You might you know, go a little bit lower, maybe tomorrow, and then you could just turn around. Remember that in March, and I believe this is March 16th. Yes, it is. 
Look at how ugly the market looked on that day. Okay, the market tried to rally this day. It gapped down, but it closed in the upper part of the range. Looked strong, so looked like it was trying to hold. It had above average volume that day on the Nasdaq, and then the next day the volume picks up even more, and the thing breaks down real hard. Now that looks ugly, right? And if you're going to short. I mean, you're going to jump all over this market on the short side right here when you see that action. I mean, that is ugly, okay? And I can remember at that point thinking that uh, that was the end of the market right there. But what happens? The next day you gap up and it stalls out. Volume is not very heavy. Uh, and then the next day you pick up volume, you stall out. But each day you actually are closing a little bit higher. The reason these are red is because I color code them from open to close. So it shows that it's an open here, kind of like a candlestick. Open here, close here, so they, they, it turns them red. I just like to have it. On some of my chart setups, I have it that way, just uh, because it instills sort of a candlestick look to what's just a bar chart. And I like to keep it simple, but I do like the information that you get uh, when you see uh, confluences of a bunch of those types of days, even when you're getting up volume, things are moving to the upside. So uh, that's why I do that. So I'll head that question off ahead of time. But my point simply is, you know, you get this ugly action. Here's, I believe, a follow-through day right here. And, uh, and it looks like it's just going to come apart. So this is looking pretty ugly. Uh, and today you had just uh, a little bit less volume. So really you're coming down and your selling is drying up. But you can also look at it as the buying this morning just dried up and kind of gave way. But I think it just tells you how choppy and sloppy this market is. So really the only thing, like I said, we're interested to sum up. Uh, the only thing we're interested in right now is silver and gold. If we, we do see other things in terms of stocks or even other ETFs or if the market switches to another signal buy or sell from the neutral signal it's at right now uh, you guys will be the first to know because we'll send out emails but essentially uh, that's all we got Dr. K you have anything to add? Yeah just uh, to, to add to what you were saying uh, about what the mark, how bad the market looked in March <clears throat> it also looked pretty bad uh, on November 16, 2010 uh, it also right looked here. pretty bad uh, yeah in February, February 4th uh, 2010. In fact, there's so many times I remember in 2009 where the market looked like it was finally going to come apart and then it would go higher. And with the NASDAQ correcting typically less than 7 or 8 percent. So right. short sellers were left uh, to haunt, you know, left uh, high and dry really um, in this QE environment. And since the QE environment is continuing along, uh, my guess is that the market, if it's going to do what it's done since March of 2009, the market's going to find its footing again and it's going to go higher. Now, if on the other hand, we, like I said, if we start to see an acceleration in selling, let's say the market has a feeble rally and then it rolls over on bigger volume and we, we see continued sell-off in leaders, well, that is obviously going to, that would push the model into a sell signal. And I would think that now this time is finally different because maybe uh, the, the market's realizing that QE is just not going to be the panacea that uh, that Bernanke claims it to be. Yeah, and, and today's comments, you know, all he said was that accommodative policy will still be necessary, may still be necessary, or will be implemented if necessary. So, you know, they might let the market drift off for a while here, but they might come in and, and uh, QE3 could be uh, a factor somewhere in here at any point. So it does make the environment a little bit more dangerous uh, either way I think than it normally would be. So what you have to do is find the things that are really trending or that have the potential for a more well-defined trend. For us, silver was really what made our year so far and uh, that's all it takes is, is really one uh, one window of opportunity to open up. So a lot of times just being patient and waiting and biding your time and watching what's going on and monitoring the market and trying not to take a biased approach in terms of trying to be a bull or a bear, just try to see where the window of opportunity opens because it'll probably be where you least expect it. So, uh, right, yeah, and, and it's it's uh, it, the, I think that patience is the hardest discipline to practice um, by even the most seasoned investors because there's a tendency to want to be part of the action, and you and you know you might see something, and we all do this. We might see something where you know enough of the ducks are in a row, so we're going to take a, we're going to take a shot at it. Uh, but in a, in a, what I've noticed over the years is that if I had just been taking, say, you know, the right pitch or in poker waiting for the right hand, uh, I would have traded considerably less and my returns would have, would have, been, uh, would have been higher. Uh, so I would have spent less time in the markets and actually had more profits at the end of the day. 
and and talking to other other traders who've been doing this for you know at least ten years, if not over twenty years, they all kind of have that uh, same view <laughs> that if they could just you know just take the wait for the perfect pitch that kind that kind of attitude, uh, it would probably uh, do their accounts um, some good. Right, and if you're looking for perfect pitches, you're in the right place, or you've come to the right place. Anyways, on that note, uh, everybody. Uh, just watch out for any GoView uh, webinars in the middle of the week if I start to feel inspired or something we think is worth commenting on uh, comes out. But, you know, the one thing we don't want to get bogged down in is creating a lot of noise for you. So uh, we'll do those when we think they're, it's the right time. I would say if we were in a nice trending uh, environment where a lot of things are working, we'd probably be doing these more often than once a week. Also, more GoView uh, webinars will be forthcoming. Uh, the technology is uh, it's not perfect but it seems to work pretty well because I would have to say that of the vast number of, of people that we send uh, the link out to every time we maybe get one two or three people who have some problems uh, listening to the video uh, or uh, <clears throat> or you know whatever uh, picking up the sound right or the video right or the whatever uh, and a lot of that could be related to bandwidth issues but we do send the feedback uh, back to uh, GoView and one uh, issue where we may be able to clarify things or get, get things a little uh, cleared up is, is in the audio because uh, we're going to change the technology we use uh, for our microphones, which may help. That was one suggestion from our uh, webmaster. So we're going to work on that uh, before we have the next webinar. So until then, you guys, good luck. And if you have any questions, you know where to email us. Take care. We'll talk to you later. So long.